Hello and welcome to today's webinar titled Designing an Award-Winning Millimeter Wave RFIC Experiences and Insights, brought to you by Keysight Technologies. This webinar is part of the Keysight Engineering Education Series. I'm Carmina. Let me introduce today's presenter. Eric Oyaforce received his Master of Science in Engineering Physics and his PhD in Microwave Technology from Uppsala University, Sweden in 2000 and 2006, respectively. In 2007, he joined the Institute of High Frequency and Quantum Electronics at the University of Siegen, Germany. Between 2008 and 2011, he was with the Institute for High Frequency and Communication Technology at the University of Wuppertal, Germany. Since 2011, he is a senior RF engineer with Sievers IMA AB in Kista, Sweden. He is a co-recipient of the 2007 IEEE Antennas and Propagation RWP King Award, the 2008 European Microwave Integrated Circuits Conference Best Paper Award, the 2010 European Microwave Conference Microwave Prize, and the 2018 IEEE RFIC Best Industry Paper Award. Welcome, Eric. You now have the floor. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Erik Ojefors and I'm with the company series IMA AB in Stockholm, Sweden. I'm going to present the work I've done together with my colleagues towards the 60 GHz 822180 RF transceiver chip in a 130 nanometer uh, CG by CMOS technology. Uh, we were honored to receive a Best Industry Paper Award when we presented this chip at last year's IEEE RFIC conference in Philadelphia. I will start the presentation by saying a few words about our company, who we are, and what we do. Uh, then we will have a look at the target application of 60 gigahertz A221180 wireless networks for outdoor applications, such as fixed wireless access and that call. Uh, this application poses some specific design challenges, and I will say a few words about the key site simulation tools we use to address these issues before we look at the chip itself. Uh, regarding the chip design, we will look at the architecture and then focus on some of the more key building blocks, such as the beamformer, LMA, PEA, and VCO. We will also see how we use modulated signals and EVM performance at the circuit design stage. Uh, measurements are obviously important, and I will show both our simulation strategy, which has a focus on system performance and how it ties into the measurement setups at an early stage. Finally, I will conclude my presentation with some comparisons to similar published year designs from other vendors. The series IMA group delivers components and subsystems for multi-gigabit wireless and fiber networks. Our wireless division is based in Stockholm at our headquarters, as well as our Gothenburg office, whereas our fiber business, CST Global, is located in Glasgow, Scotland. In all, there are more than 100 employees and consultants at these three sites. On the wireless side, our key ORF competence is within the millimeter wave chip and module design for multi-gigabit communication. The current focus is on 60 gigahertz A221180 or AY Vigig network standard, as well as millimeter wave 5G. Transceiver designs for these applications require knowledge in phase antenna array design, on-chip beamforming networks, and low phase noise synthesizers. Uh, let's start off with a look at the fixed wireless application we have in mind for this chip. Uh, we are not targeting the typical short-range indoor applications of 821180 or VIA. Our use case, as you can see in the picture here on the left, is outdoor point-to-point -point and self-organizing mesh networks providing backhaul in the unlicensed 60 gigahertz band at distances up to 500 meters. Uh, there are some new FCC and ETS rules uh, that uh, enables this application. One such rule is that you're allowed to uh, radiate 40 dBm ERP uh, with a low gain, typically 20 dBm antenna, and that requires us to generate up to 20 dBm TX power. The frequency range has been extended from 57 to 66 gigahertz up to 57 to 71 gigahertz in many jurisdictions. That essentially gives us two extra channels and simplifies network planning. There is also an interest in dense networks to use half channel uh, uh, with uh, higher order modulation such as 256 quam. Uh, that requires us to have a good phase noise performance, and we targeted uh, phase noise of below 100 uh, dBc at 1 MHz offset. 
In all, these are the key performance parameters where we saw a need in the market, and we try to simultaneously fulfill it with this chip design. If you look at our solution for this infrastructure type millimeter memory market, we provide a 60 gigahertz beamform and transceiver chip manufactured in a silicon germanium by Siemens technology. It's equipped with 16 Oryx and 16 TX antenna pulse and generates up to 20 dBm TX power. In a typical application, it's used with the 20 dBi patch antenna array on the PCB to provide a plus minus 9 degree uh, fixed antenna beam of elevation plane and a plus minus 4 to 5 degree of uh, beam steering of awesome plane with up to 40 dBm EIRP over the full 57 to 71 gigahertz bandwidth. The main application is 802.11 AD wireless networking standard, uh, which can give you gross bit rates up to 4.62 gigabits per second using system core modulation. This is a challenging system design where we have uh, one gigahertz baseband bandwidth and severe timing requirements, for instance, um, less than 35 nanoseconds to do beam steering over to 64 beams. It's also a competitive market with a clear demand for first time right designs. If you look at the design challenges we face, the first challenge was to maximize the output power with an acceptable EVM and easy power consumption. Now, modulations in 82.11.88, we are quite robust. The operation close to P1dB is usually possible. In that case, the output IP3 is not a really useful tool to determine the performance. Instead, we like to predict the output power using an actual 82.11.80 waveform in an envelope simulation. Our goal was to maximize output power with a TX EVM below 21 dB, that is the 82.11.80 spec, and do it both on the transistor level in cadence design environment to check, for instance, PA load and bias conditions, but to also do EVM partitioning, for instance, between the PA and VCO in the system simulator. We also found it um, helpful to get constellation diagrams early in the circuit design. We think it's great for intuitive understanding, for instance, of A and P and effects and asymmetries in the design. Other challenges we face is the fact that we, for instance, have a channel width of uh, 2 gigahertz, and uh, we have to cover a 57 to 71 gigahertz frequency range. Uh, as you see on the right, um, the frequency response is usually not like uh, either in the RF or the analog baseband path. And we needed to model the VM degradation and spectrum uh, in the system simulator. Uh, we have a fairly high phase noise requirement uh, and a large span to cover. We do that with two VCO cores and a reactor fixed cap topology. That means that we end up with a large simulation matrix requiring a fast simulator to check uh, that we have continuous coverage and good tuning properties over the full band, and also, of course, over bias and temperature. And in all, we also have a high circuit complexity. We have uh, 16 TX, 16 Oryx pulse, and on chip frequency generation. If we would like to simulate the full uh, chip, we obviously need an HP simulator capable of speed and ability to handle large designs. Uh, so let's have a look at the, some of the key side tools we used in the design flow. It's mainly the system view, system simulator, the Golden Gate uh, circuit simulator, and the use of virtual test benches in the simulation flow. This is the 82.11.AD test bench for system view, and I don't expect you to see all the details and all the text here, but let me walk you through how it works. On the left, we have a baseband source, uh, which provides 82.11.AD modulation. That uh, signal gets filtered, and we can optionally choose to upconvert it to 60 gigahertz if our DUT is, for instance, an amplifier. We put our DUT uh, either as a Golden Gate uh, circuit model, a fast uh, circuit envelope simulation model, directly into system view. Or we can put this as the link type of component. Uh, this means that the DUT will be in this position if we make a virtual test bench out of this uh, system view block diagram. Then we have our analysis tools, such as EVM, Spectrum. We can even say the waveform. And if we look at the output, we can see what happens when we stress our power amplifier, for instance, what happens to the spectrum or the constellation when we increase the output power. 
We can also reverse this flow by using the system view block diagram as a virtual test bench, uh, using it as what we call a VTB in the Cadence Virtuos environment. What you can do is that the Golden Gate simulator can import the system view test branches into an envelope transient simulation. Uh, and uh, what you see to the left is the, the first part of our test bench. In the middle, you have a system view link component, which would become our circuit. And on the right, you have the analysis part of the test bench. Uh, these parts get linked by ports uh, in the circuit diagram and the ports of the SVE link component in the block diagram. And you put the ports in your circuit, and they link together with the system view block diagram. And once you have this running, you can get the EVM constellation and output power directly in your Cadence Virtuoso environment without even entering a system view. Uh, so let us move on to the chip design and simulation. We'll have a look at the architecture of a chip and also focus on some key circuit blocks, such as the beam former and LMA, PA, and VCO. We we'll also see how we use modulated signals and EVM performance at the transistor level to give, and also give an early feedback to system simulation. So let's have a look at the chip architecture and block diagram. We see that we have separate TX and RX RF beamformers, both with 16 antenna paths, and each equipped with controllable amplifiers and phase shifters for the beam steering. The reason that we use separate TX and RX antennas is that we wanted to avoid the relatively high losses of a 60 gigahertz TR switch in 130 nanometer by CMOS technology. For the transceiver, we choose a zero IF up and down conversion architecture. But it's partly because we have very wide channels with a 1 gigahertz baseband bandwidth. The LO to the up and down converter is fed by a 20 gigahertz dual BCO low phase noise synthesizer through a frequency tripler. And finally, we have also integrated the RX and TX baseband amplifiers, including filtering on the chip. There's also other functionality integrated on chip, uh, such as a digital control block that contains the ASRAMs that store the beam steering lookup tables for the phase shifters. If you look at the RX beam form and front end design, we have a cascade LMA at the input. It provides a noise figure of 4.5 dB and a 15 dB gain. To make it a wideband design, we didn't use any capacitors in the tuning. Uh, all tuning is done by uh, inductor design. VSD input stub and uh, output uh, transformer balance. Uh, this LNA is the first stage uh, in the beamformer. Uh, it's cascaded with a VGA to provide uh, 25 dB gain and 12 dB uh, control range. Then it's followed by a vector phase shifter that consists of a 90 degree transmission line coupler uh, feeding the two quadrature signals into Gilbert cell cores, both of them are controlled by DAX, and this becomes our vector phase shifter. The output is self-rebalanced to a 16 to 1 combiner network. Uh, for the passive modeling of LNA and the VGA block, uh, we started out with a quite conventional uh, design in momentum. We designed the passives as individual uh, layouts and simulated them individually, both output balance transformer and the input network consisting of the EFT stub and the emitter generation. But uh, since I have quite a bit of gain and we were concerned about stability, we also choose to do a global EM design, uh, which uh, consists of full uh, passes and interconnects of both LNA and the cascaded VGA, which you can see here on the right. Uh, we compare the results we got with this global model in momentum to the ones we had with the individual EM models, and we saw a difference of less than 1 dB in the S21. And that indicated to us that we have quite low coupling between the passive elements in the design. We also did some full or exchange simulations with Golden Gate uh, small signal noise analysis and two-tone simulation. Our main focus was to check for noise performance and frequency flatness, as well as being able to test drive the full orc chain in the simulator with CW signals. For instance, to check for proper circuit operation, including bias and top-level connectivity. 
since it's difficult to feed all 16 RX inputs correctly in the measurement, uh, only with, uh, in the simulation we can easily assess the full 16 antenna noise figure by using an ideal uh, power splitter to emulate the total RF power impinging on the array. Then we cascaded that uh, splitter with the uh, S-parameter model uh, of the package and PCB. And then we ran the full simulation um, through uh, the circuit from the input through the splitter package and PCB model and the RX beam former the down conversion step and our baseband amplifiers. And if you look at the results, we see a total noise figure of about 8 dB uh, and uh, a gain of 79 dB. Uh, we could do this simulation over, as you see, both frequencies and different temperatures. This is difficult to simulation to run because we have 16 amplifier paths, we have the mixtures, we have the baseband amplifiers with RF, LO, and baseband frequencies and harmonics. It still worked in the Golden Gate simulator, although the simulation was uh, quite heavy. It took about 1.5 hours. If you look at the TX beamformer and front design, it uses a phase shifter similar to the RX path. It's followed by a two-stage PEA. The first part of the PEA, as you see on the left, is a current shunting VGA architecture. Uh, it's uh, coupled through an uh, interstate transformer to a final stage, which is a differential cascode. And again, we use an output transformer ballon um, for the matching. Uh, we use transformer matching throughout the circuit for maximum bandwidth, and we achieved a simulated uh, saturated output power of 16 dBm. As seen in the case of the ORC chain, we did the modeling of the TX chain passive of a VGA and PA with ADS momentum, where we targeted the maximum gain flatness as well as proper low conditions for the PA. In addition to the individual models of the transformers and inductors, we also made a global momentum EM model you see at the bottom left, uh, which includes the input generation inductor, the interstage matching transformer, and the output transformer ballon. Then, in the figure to the right, you can see the S21 simulation of the cascaded VGA and PA stages. The red curve is the result we obtained with the individual passive models, and the blue one using the global momentum model. We see that we have a very close match, particularly across our 57 to 71 gigahertz target bandwidth, where we have less than 1 dB of gain variation. Uh, you can also see that we have quite a gain peak to the right um, at 95 gigahertz. And that is because this particular comparison simulation did not include the full device parasitics. If you do include them, you will see a much flatter response. Um, so let's see how we used uh, virtual test benches for the um, PA simulation. To the left, we see the classical simulation results available to the circuit designer, such as a gain on A and PM. These results, um, together with other classical metrics like IP3, are, of course, quite helpful to me as a designer and a good indication of the performance. But they're not always sufficient to optimize the circuit for best performance in the system. Uh, to the right, we have uh, output available to me as a circuit designer in the Canaan's environment with Golden Gate running a VTB from system view. Now I can immediately see the impact of circuit changes at transistor levels on system parameters, such as EVM, spectral mask, and constellation. This view was also helpful to evaluate the impact of temperature, quarters, and other statistical tests typically run by the circuit designers from the Kano's analog design environment. Uh, to set this VTB up in the Kano schematic and AD Explorer interface, all you need to do is uh, choose the Golden Gate as your simulator. Uh, you choose an envelope simulation and uh, VTB setup. In the VTB setup, you can uh, change uh, some variables which get Fed back into the system view test bench. And then obviously you have to define the input and output ports in your schematic view and couple them to your test bench. Um, so let's see how we used these VTBs for the PA analysis when we were optimizing the EVM for a 16 quam uh, signal operating close to P1DB, where, as we said, the output type of free is not a really helpful tool. 
to the left here, we have the result you would get with a conjugate match. Obviously, no PA designer would uh, match a PA like that. But uh, for illustration, what we can see here is that obviously we get a very high AMP um, effect that limits our EVM early in uh, compression. If you would go for a more sensible, typical uh, load pole match for a maximum PSAT uh, or P1DB, we see a much better results, but we see still some close to compression, some AMP, and particularly in the corner points. What we found out was that we had to drop the um, load impedance even more on the PA to end up with an optimized design. The constellation diagram we see here on the right, here we have optimized the load for um, maximum output power with the EVM at the minus 21 dB limit. You can still see that we can run into a fair amount of compression and still not see any AMP effect, and this was the best compromise for a good EVM. Another key component in our chip design for minimum EVM with higher order modulation is the VCO. Uh, the value is generated at 20 gigahertz and frequency triples to 60 gigahertz by a frequency multiplier. We use two VCOs. Um, um, to cover the full 57 to 71 gigahertz bandwidth. The VCO itself uh, is, as you can see, a cross-coupled pair. <clears throat> uh, we have an inductor uh, at the top of the design here with uh, implemented in two top metals for minimum losses. We use a uh, mean cap bank uh, with switches for the digital coarse tuning. We have a staggered biased VCO uh, varactor with several varactors in parallel to uh, get a uh, linear fine tuning. And for minimum noise, we use switch resistor opposed to normal current source uh, to bias the VCO core. Uh, it's obviously important with a design like this to uh, get uh, uh, continuous tuning with the coarse tuning and the fine tuning and also to see that we have a nice and linear fine-tuning behavior over the tune voltage. And as you can see in this Golden Gate simulation for the lower frequency VCO, we succeeded quite well. We also met our phase to noise target of minus 112 dBc at 1 MHz offset. On the left, you can see the manufactured chip. Uh, the size is 4.8 times 4.3 millimeter. In the picture, you can clearly recognize the RX and TX beamformer banks on the left and right side of the chip. You can also see the digital control block and the transceiver parts at the center of the die. Uh, the chip was manufactured in a 130 nanometer silicon germanium basimos technology. DC power consumption is 2.6 watts in RX mode and 5 watt in TX mode with the full output power. Uh, we choose to package the chip in an EWLB BGA type of package with 500 micrometer ball pitch in order to facilitate the design of a matching PCB. As you can see to the right, we also have an exposed die on the back side of the package for improved cooling. It's a fairly large package, but we still manage to keep the chip to PCB or its insertion loss below 2 dB. Uh, let's move on to the measurements and how those measurements compare to the simulations. As I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of focus on modulated signals and EVM performance. We will also see a little bit of a link between simulations and the measurements. We will look at the TX compression and EVM measurements. On the ORIC side, we will look at the noise figure and also at the EVM measurements. Uh, for the synthesizer, the phase noise is obviously important and how it compares to the simulations. We'll see some beam steering results obtained with the PCB patch antenna array used together with the chip. And finally, we'll have a look at some over-the-air full system tests uh, where we obtain a data rate of up to 10 gigabits per second. Uh, in the plot to the left, you can see the measured TX output compression in the bare die configuration. We see that we have a quite flat frequency response, uh, the different curves of the measured compression from 58 to 69 gigahertz, and as you can see, they differ about 1 dB. The measured output P1 dB point is 12 dBm, and the saturated output power is 14 dBm. 
Now, this is slightly lower than our simulation results, but again, this is partly caused by the fact that the ship was not loaded with the intended package parasitics in this paradigm configuration we used for the measurement. Uh, the spread between the 16 different antenna paths is less than 1 dB, and if we sum the power from all these uh, 16 antenna outputs, we get an output P1 dB of 24 dBm, which is sufficient to reach uh, 20 dBm output power with some back off. If you continue to the TX EVM measurements, we use a setup over the TX and RX verification. Uh, it's a single antenna setup uh, which uh, supports the measurements of modulated signals, and we can also put it into a temperature chamber. Uh, we use the Keysight A221180 setup. It consists of a high speed scope for a digitization of a signal, an arbitrary waveform generator to generate the baseband signal. A DUT, which could be TX, RX, or a full link. We usually put them in a temperature chamber. We have a spectrum analyzer used as a down converter for TX measurements, and a reference transmitter used um, for RX measurements. Finally, we use the VSA or Wideband Waveform Center software for the signal analysis. Now, if we look at the TX, it's, it's quite interesting to compare the constellation diagram we observed in system view to what we can actually measure. We do it here for, uh, uh, with a constellation close to P1 dB. It's a MCS 12 16 quam modulation. And to the left here, we see the constellation we obtained with system view for with the FCE model of our transmitter chain. And on the right here, or in the middle, you can see the measured constellation with uh, the wideband waveform center. You can see the similarity. We're in both cases able to run the transmitter into quite a bit of compression uh, and still maintain uh, minus, uh, close to minus 21 dB EVM, as you can see in the figure at right. And we have a very good agreement between the simulation and the actual system measurement. On the OREC side, we started with the noise figure measurement. We use a quite typical um, hot cold setup uh, for the noise figure measurement with a noise source. You can see it on the upper left, feeding a wafer probe. And then we bring out the IQ signals from the chip to a ballon and a spectrum analyzer. Uh, in this configuration, we can actually only test a single antenna path, one out of 16. And that means that we get some noise figure penalty due to the fact that we have 15 inactive ports on the internal power combiner. So to get a feeling for what uh, this result would mean for the total noise figure, we have to compare it with simulations uh, using Golden Gate SSNA, which can predict the results for a full antenna configuration as well as a single antenna configuration and see how well they line up. And if you look at the result for a single antenna path, it's uh, at about 6 dB, quite consistent for the, all of the different inputs. We see a little bit of a higher noise figure at the lowest frequencies it's due to the fact that the Oryx chain is um, tuned to work well in a package and we measure here without a package. So with the package parasitics, uh, we will have a fairly flat noise figure across the full band. If we move on to the VCO and synthesizer measurements, you can here at the left side see uh, the phase noise uh, measured at 60 gigahertz. Uh, we can see for our full synthesized setup that we, uh, for all frequencies represented by the different colors here, at, that we at one megahertz offset get a measured phase noise of minus 101 dBc. Uh, the integrated phase noise across uh, 400 kilohertz to one gigahertz is minus uh, 33 dBc. That supports essentially 128 quam signal carrier modulation in the 2 gigahertz bandwidth. If you look at the simulated uh, phase noise of just the VCO without the synthesizer, that's the blue dashed curve, uh, we can see that with outside the locking bandwidth of the synthesizer that it matches very closely the measured phase noise of the full synthesizer. To test the beam forming of a chip, we assemble the chip with a PCB antenna, which you can see here on the left. Um, on the top of the PCB, you can see the OREX array, 
At the bottom of a PCB, you have a TX array and a shield in the middle. Each of the arrays consists of 16 times 2 vertically polarized antennas. It's configured for only beam steering in the azimuth plane. We have a fixed beam in the elevation plane, so each channel from a chip feeds a single column. The antenna covers the full 57 to 71 gigahertz bandwidth. If we look at what happens when we program a chip for uh, different beams, we see that we can uh, steer the beam plus minus 45 degrees in, with a 64-step beam book, and we have a side lobe level which is at least suppressed by 10 dB. We also see that we reach uh, our 40 dBm EIRP at borosite. To aid in the discussions with uh, our customers and modem partners, we put together a full TX2 RX or their test match and system view. It's also quite helpful to be able to compare the results to see in full system measurements with the expected results from simulations. Now, due to the complexity of the test bench, we choose to only model a few of the components, uh, such as the critical parts like the PA with FC models. And then we used the standard uh, circuit blocks for, uh, for instance, the LNA, where we just put in the noise uh, figure we had simulated, and we did the same for the VCO. Once you have this uh, test bench, you can look at the total effect of IQ imbalance, phase noise, PA, nonlinearity, LNA, noise figure, and filtering. And we can observe EVM degradation along the signal path. For instance, before the PA on the transmit side, we see an EVM of minus 33.2 dB. Uh, then uh, after the PA, we're down to an EVM of minus 24.9 dB. Going through the path loss of the link uh, and uh, the LNA, we further reduce the EVM down to minus 24.3 dB. And in this case, our final EVM we expect for the link would be minus 24.3 dB. Now, let's compare the total EVM performance of the system, which we saw in the previous slide, to actual measurements we do of the full system. We do it for MCS 12 and 16 QAM, and here on the top left, you can see that our measured TX EVM is minus 28 dB. We use this as our reference transmitter in the setup, and we tune the TX for optimum EVM, which means that we operate with a fair amount of back off. Then we introduce our actual receiver, and we see the full system's performance now on the lower left. We still have a quite good EVM of minus 25 dB, and we should compare that to, to the MCS threshold, uh, MCS 12 threshold, which is minus 14.5 dB. We can now also monitor the performance of the full system over temperature, frequency, power, uh, and bias, and see that we can maintain a good overall performance. For the full system, TX to Oryx or Rivera measurements, we went a little bit beyond the standard 82.11.80 modulations. We used a custom modem to access higher order, order modulations. For instance, on the top right, you can see 128 QAM in a 1.8 gigahertz uh, bandwidth. Uh, this is a modulation which allows us to push 10 gigabit per second across the link, and we do it with an MSC of minus 27 dBc. On the top left, uh, we have half a band with 900 megahertz, but we go to a 256 QAM modulation. That allows us to get uh, 7 gigabits per second throughput with an MSE of minus 31 uh, dBc. And on the lower left and right, you can see lo lower order modulations such as 64 QAM and 16 QAM, which obviously work well as well. These results were obtained uh, with, uh, as I said, over, uh, over the air link and were measured with the antennas tilted and the beams tilted for 45 degree of bore site. So let's conclude and see how our results compare to the state of the art. In this list, I compare a few published 60 gigahertz beam steering transceiver results. If we look at the number of antenna paths, we can see that the chosen configuration of 16RX plus 16TX is quite similar to other chips.
Our operating frequency range is larger than most other implementations. I think we had the first chip to cover the full 57 to 71 gigahertz frequency range. Uh, when we look at the um, combined output P1dB of all antenna outputs, we get um, 22 dBm in the lower frequency range and 20 dBm for the top two channels with the packet chip. Uh, if you use our chip together with a typical 20 dBi patch antenna array, you can reach the legal limit of 40 dBm EIRP, which is significantly higher than previously reported results. The phase noise is what I believe the best in class at minus 101 dBc at 1 MHz offset. The price we pay for the improved performance, and in particular the high TX power, is a somewhat higher power consumption, which peaks at 5 watt in TX mode with full output power. So to conclude, um, I've shown a 60 GHz 16-channel beam steering transceiver which has a key feature of being able to generate uh, 40 dBm effective isotropic radiated power when used with a 20 dBi patch antenna array. The frequency range we cover is 57 to 71 gigahertz. And we cover that using wideband matching and VCO design techniques. Uh, we used ADS momentum uh, quite extensively for all of the custom inductors, transformers, and we also did full circuit uh, passive modeling of critical blocks. Uh, the phase noise performance of minus 101 dBc at 1 MHz offset supports 256 core modulation across an over the air link. Uh, we used the Golden Gate uh, circuit simulator and virtual test benches uh, in the circuit design phase already at a uh, transistor level. It helped us see things like EVM and spectrum estimation with the real 82.11 AD waveforms directly in the cadence environment. We also did it the other way around. We exported fast circuit envelope models uh, from the circuit simulator to system view system simulator and used that to refine full system simulations. Uh, finally, we used the Golden Gate uh, harmonic balance simulator, its speed and its convergence to support um, top level simulation of the full TX and RX paths of the chip. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Eric. Okay, Eric, here is your first question. Eric, this question comes from George. Can the techniques used to measure EVM in the simulation be easily applied to other technologies such as 5G? Yes, you can um, use uh, today already the system you flow, that you take a model, you generate in your Golden Gate circuit simulator and bring it in back into the system view system simulator. Um, if you would like to use the um, IGN or waveforms and use virtual test benches on the Golden Gate uh, platform, that is to use it with virtual test benches, you have to wait a few months for the next release of Golden Gate because uh, it needs the right uh, latest version of the system view in engine integrated. But uh, yes, in principle, it works uh, both flows uh, quite soon. Well, thank you. Uh, this question comes from Ian. How much time in the design process do you feel was saved using VTBs versus traditional simulations? Um, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to quantify time, but I would say um, we wouldn't have seen a lot of things like um, uh, that we get the output power we need with the EVM we like to see in this application. Um, so we would probably have um, targeted the wrong metrics. Uh, we would have targeted output IP3 and the other metrics derived from the system specification. So what that would have probably led to would be, have, would be that they would have um, probably needed another design cycle. And that's probably, a, well, half year design work and maybe 500,000 expenses for another round packaging and so so it's quite a bit of time and money you can save by essentially targeting the right uh, performance from the beginning. Great, thank you. Here's a question for Marie. Uh, uh, was it challenging switching between the key site and cadence environments? I mean, uh, I've been using all of tools for 
quite some time. So, I'm, of course, I was familiar with ADF, uh, which also is used as a data display in uh, with the Golden Gate uh, simulator. So, it was not challenging to me, and I think anyone using Cadence with also would not have any problem uh, using the key sign tools. What could be a little bit of an issue sometimes is uh, that uh, if you use ADS in your flow, not Golden Gate, the Golden Gate can work um, directly with the uh, kit you have for Cadence. But if you use ADS, you need to have a PDK from the founder, which is, has been uh, correctly enabled. And there might be some issues there. And typically, you just have to talk to your founder and key site and make sure that they sort out any issues that might appear at that point. Great. Thank you. And here's a question from Fed. Could you please talk about frequency tripler to get from 20 gigahertz to 60 gigahertz? Uh, yeah, that was actually a very simple design. It's essentially just a differential amplifier, two stage differential amplifier with the uh, output tanks tuned to the uh, third harmonic. Um, it's been, um, we used it for quite a couple of years and it's been a very simple circuit and it worked fairly well. Thank you. And this question comes from Sarush. In the PA design, if we have 16, 20 dBm PAs working, the die operating temperatures rises up. How do you consider temperature in your early design cycle? Well, ideally, you might want to use tools uh, for uh, electrothermal simulations uh, and that type of design flow. In this particular project, we were uh, we didn't really have a time to uh, consider such flow. So we knew from the beginning that it was going to be a hot chip. Uh, we designed uh, the circuits with the correct uh, or uh, anticipated operating tem temperatures. Uh, we obviously uh, uh, had to design a proper cooling uh, for this chip as well. Uh, what we also found out was um, uh, they have a little bit of temperature going up and down when we switch between RX and TX mode, and uh, that can cause temperature gradients across the ship. And you have to pay attention in the circuit design, especially in the layout of uh, differential amplifiers, but that, doesn't, uh, but that temperature gradient doesn't cause any uh, unsymmetric behavior. Very good. Thank you. Here's a, a question from Tushar. I was wondering what kind of antennas you use to radiate the power. If it's a patch antenna array, what is the use of wideband frequency range? Uh, well, the antenna design is a patch antenna array, and it was a quite challenging part of this project because we're not only doing the uh, ASIC, we're also uh, producing this uh, uh, antenna substrate, PCB, that goes together with the IC. Uh, essentially, we managed to uh, design a wideband uh, uh, patch antenna array that actually covers that full uh, bandwidth, and we had to use some special techniques and uh, multiple layers and uh, parasitic patches. Great. Here's a question from Denis. Is it possible to make TX power amplifier with one watt output power on SIGI or RFC MOS? Well, I mean, it's certainly possible. Um, if you look at the combined output power of uh, this ship, we are in saturation almost at half a watt, but that would be in, involve uh, quite a bit of power combining. Uh, yes, I think it is. It's more of an issue, especially at these high frequencies, whether it's practical. Uh, you probably need to do a, a bit of power combining, and you may need to make sure that the losses uh, are not excessive and that you can handle the formal output. Thank you. And here's a question from Rizwan. How much isolation do you get between TX and RX part of the ASIC, given that TX is generating large output power and RX is receiving small signals? Uh, 8211A, the like typical Wi-Fi, is a TDD standard. That means that we don't transmit and receive at the same time. So we didn't really consider isolation in this project. Uh, that said, I think we actually have a fair amount of isolation, but uh, I can't quote a number. Great. And here's a question from Masa. Did you also merge your PCB plus package EM model with OC chip passive components at the RX front end? With PCB package model, 
did you have very close input return loss to the measured one? Yeah, I mean, we we code essentially co-designed the PCB <coughs> package and um, uh, chip uh, uh, with all these passive components in these uh, at these three levels. Um, I, I think we uh, essentially targeted that we would have a low uh, input return loss. I don't have a measurement right here, but I think we succeeded fairly well. Uh, with that full chain to get a good uh, uh, low input return loss through the entire chain. Okay, and here's another question from Fed. In the VCO, you used a switchable resistor instead of a current source. How much phase noise reduction do you get comparing to using a tail current source? Um, well, I did not personally <laughs> design the VCO. I know it's it's a, it's quite useful. It um, but I, I don't have a number for the re reduction. What you obviously need to do is also you need to tune that current source or these resistors in this case or, or to select an optimum operating point. Uh, it gives a, a sizable uh, reduction in uh, phase noise performance. Thank you. Here's a question from Abe. With this methodology linking system and circuit simulations, could you envision to evaluate the correction, some of the RF impairments at the digital level? Yeah, I mean, uh, that could certainly be done um, in system view. It's quite easy to include um, uh, other uh, blocks like a uh, digital PD store or DPD or something like that. Uh, that has not been very common at these frequencies and these bandwidths uh, will meet way, but it could definitely be done in, in the simulator, yeah. Great, and here's a question from Dan. If this by CMOS architecture has to transfer to CMOS process, has to trans to CMOS process, what's the major, cha what, what's the major challenge? Um, I think it's quite feasible to, to transfer this uh, design to, to CMOS. Uh, process. Uh, power amplifiers typically are always a challenge in, uh, in CMOS, particularly uh, reliability and uh, output power. Uh, the VCO might need to do some redesign, but in principle, I think it's quite doable to do uh, such a transition. Very good. And here's a question from Suresh. What is the typical yield of chip design and packaging in your design? Uh, I've seen some yield numbers. I think they are in the range of 80%. Uh, could be more, could be less, but at least in that range. Okay, very good. And then uh, from Oleg, what is what boundary of SIGI process has been used? Can you let me know? Yes. For this uh, first version of this ship, it was for a low low volume uh, application in a sense. So here we use the German foundry IHP, which specializes on uh, smaller quantities. Uh, for a larger quantity, we would um, go for, for another uh, technology provider. Great, that was our last question, Eric. Uh, there are more, but uh, in the time that we have, uh, I know that we can always, you can always uh, answer them uh, in email. Any closing comments today for our audience? Well, I'd like to thank uh, my co-workers at Sirius IMA, Mikael Andreasson, Torgel Kjellberg, Lars Aspermyr, Rikka Nilsson, Anders Söderhjeld, Håkan Berg, Robin Dahlbeck, and Mats Karlsson, who all contributed to this work. Uh, I'd also thank some of our technical contacts at Keysight, in particular, Cedric Pujol, who actually introduced us to this flow and has been a great help in this project. Um, well, that was all. I'd like to say, except for that, uh, thank you for attending this uh, presentation. Yeah, and thank you for presenting, and congratulations on again to you and your team uh, for that award that you received at the RFIC Symposium last year. Uh, thank you again. Thank you for attending today's webinar, brought to you by Keysight Technologies.